Spirit. We are your hosts. I'm Pastor Penny Schultz. And I'm Kristen Sharon. Have you heard of the four horsemen of the apocalypse? Who are they and what do they represent? And why did God show this to John for him to record for the ages? And how close are we to their coming? Tune in today as we dive headfirst into the exciting sixth chapter of the book of Revelation and explore what the seals broken by Christ have to say. Join us as adventures through God's Word, the Holy Lands, and beyond, exploring the fascinating and the weird, the difficult and the obscure. Come and see how the stories are woven together and how they still apply to our lives today. We promise to bring you joy, hope, inspiration, and intriguing out-of-the-box thinking, and ultimately, salvation through Jesus Christ. Well, we left off last time with the throne room of God, Jesus the slain lamb, that was the only one worthy to open the scroll. And why? Because he is the go-on. And if you don't know what that is, boy, I really encourage you to go back last, check out the one before this, as we dive into what the Goel really is and how the book of Ruth and Ex- Boaz explains that tradition and that story and just adds another really amazing piece. And really why the book of Ruth is in the Bible <laughs> is to explain chapter 5 in Revelation. In Revelation. So today we're going to look at that scroll as it is being rolled back and the message it has for us. We'll explore just how close we might actually be to these events that are unfolding around us. Well, as we've talked about multiple times, there is the added blessing that you get for reading and hearing these words. So once again, we'll start off reading the scripture to you today. I watched as the Lamb opened the first of the seven seals. Then I heard one of the four living creatures say in a voice like thunder, Come, I looked, and there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bow, and he was given a crown, and he rode out as conqueror, bent on conquest. When the lamb opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come! Then another horse came out, a fiery red one. Its rider was given power to take peace from the earth and to make people kill each other. To him was given a large sword. When the lamb opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come! I looked, and there before me was a black horse. Its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand. Then I heard what sounded like a voice among the four living creatures saying, Two pounds of wheat for a day's wages, and six pounds of barley for a day's wages, and do not damage the oil and the wine. When the lamb opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come! I looked, and there before me was a pale horse. Its rider was named Death and Hades was following close behind him. They were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine, and plague, and by the wild beasts of the earth. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. They called out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? Then each of them was given a white robe, and they were told to wait a little longer until the full number of their fellow servants, their brothers and sisters, were killed just as they had been. I watched as he opened the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair, and the whole moon turned blood red. And the stars in the sky fell to earth as figs drop from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. The heavens receded like a scroll being rolled up. And every mountain and island was removed from its place. The kings of the earth and the princes and the generals, the rich, the mighty, and everyone else, both slave and free, hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. They called to the mountains and to the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can withstand it? Well, there is a lot (laughs) in that. There is. So we see the Lamb is going to be opening the seven seals. Mm -hmm. And we have the wonderful four horses. Yes. So if you've heard the four horsemen of the apocalypse, that phrase, this is where it comes from. Mm -hmm. And it's from the first of the four seals. You know, last week we looked at, and I saw in him, 
the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. Mm -hmm. To go back in case you have not watched the last time, we really encourage you to watch chapter 5, but the whole point was the scroll has got writing on both sides. And there's only one time that a scroll is ever written on the outside. And that was if there was a, a deed. A land yes, deed. if it was a land contract. And on the outside were the witnesses and who was actually the rightful heir to open that those seals. And when you open it, it wasn't just like one big one. It would like open and tear in. It, it's kind of difficult, but to explain but right <laughs> it's not just like seven out on the on the outside right you open it in a little bit and then open it a little bit more open mm -hmm. a little bit more yeah so here is the interesting thing when you get into the whole argument about pre-trib mid-trib post-trib mm -hmm. you know, the whole thing when, when's the rapture going to happen well this is an interesting tidbit mm -hmm. because the church is actually mentioned 19 times but it's not that's in those first chapters but it's not mentioned again until chapter 19. So from chapter 6 to chapter 18, the church is not mentioned anymore. To me, that's pretty telling. A good indication that we will not be here for any of this. Right. You know, there's a lot of things that the Bible is kind of silent on that we kind of take liberty to say, well, we know and we don't, don't really know. know. You know. Some people think that the rapture, I mean, that the tribulation happens right after the rapture, but there's no biblical backing for that. It no. could be a time span, because we do not know the day or the hour which is coming, but then we don't also know the day or the hour when the full seven years start, start to play out. Sure. Yeah, biblically, there's just not any good, clear indication either way. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes Christians look at our environment and say, well, it's bad, but it's not really that bad, so, you know, I don't need to worry. But the rapture could still happen at any, any time. time, so we must be ready. Mm -hmm. And we're called to be ready, and the Bible is not silent on that. It tells us multiple times, Jesus tells us multiple times, that we need to be ready at any time. Mm -hmm. Well... A lot of the research that I have done throughout all the years, um, Jack Van Epke from little on, even uh, Billy Graham and Chuck Missler and Gary Hamrick and Dr. Thomas Horn and Reverend Donna Howell and Dr. Michael Heiser and Ron Peterson and the, name, the list just keeps going and going and going. and um, This is not just um, the whims of my, my own inner thinking. <laughs> it's been years and years of research in there again. This is just a lot of stuff pulled together, uh, whether you're dispensation or eschatology, however you're looking at the end times, however you study it, there's going to be many different trains of thought. Mm -hmm. And so we're just kind of giving you a broad overview a little bit, but we want to pick out some of those things that the Spirit has actually laid on our hearts. So in Revelation 6, there is a correlation, and I'm going to put up this chart, between that and Matthew 24 when Jesus is giving the Olivet Discord. When they ask him, they go, what's going to happen? Mm -hmm. You know, We see in Revelation 6 here, we have a white horse, and Jesus talks about the false Christ. There's the red horse, which is war, and Jesus says there's going to be wars and rumors of wars. And there's the black horse that's famine, and Jesus says there will be famine. And the pale horse is death, and Jesus said, there will be death. <laughs> and there's martyrs, and Jesus said, there will be martyrs. And worldwide chaos. And worldwide chaos. So they really match up together quite well. <laughs> Almost exactly. You know, Daniel 9, and why do we bring in Daniel 9? Because you can't just study the book of Revelation and get the whole picture. No. Nope. You it's, gotta grab the puzzle pieces from elsewhere mm -hmm, in the Bible. From and it's pretty much usually from the Old Testament, but there's some from the New Testament as well. So that week, that well, they call it the week, but it's the seven years mm -hmm. that of the tribulation that everyone talks about, and they know, you know, they they they've heard this, so it's common knowledge, kind of. Mm -hmm. From Daniel nine twenty seven and. He shall confirm the covenant with the many for one week, and in the midst of the one week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Now that's pretty wordy. <laughs> that's really wordy. Um, 
Yeah, that's why I'm so glad we've had <laughs> scholars and stuff to help chew through that. Mm -hmm. So we're going to start right here in chapter 6 at the beginning. John, who's watching all this, says, I watched as the Lamb opened the first of the seven seals. And who is the Lamb? Jesus. Mm -hmm. And then I heard one of the four living creatures say in a loud voice, like thunder, come. come. And I looked, and there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bow, and he was given a crown, and he rode out as conqueror, bent on conquest. Well, the first seals are attached to the four horsemen, and each seal will explain God's wrath poured out on the earth. So in verse 1, Jesus is showing him this white horse. Now, some think that the white horse is Christ. No. No. He is not, because Jesus does not come until chapter, chapter 19, 19, towards the end. He says he has a bow, which is the symbol of peace, but there's no arrows. arrows. And he is coming under the guise of peace, but the arrows are hidden. Right. The appearance of peace, but he does not plan on peace. It says he has a crown, but it's a Stephanos crown, and we've talked about that. It's that's like, the, the Greek, that's the temporary crown. Mm -hmm. Jesus is described as having the diadem. diadem, yes, which is the royal crown. So the white horse is really referring to the Antichrist. The titles for the Antichrist are the man of lawlessness, the abomination that causes desolation, and that's, that's what Daniel's <laughs> talking about. All those words, that's uh -huh. what that is. The Beast, which is in Second Thessalonians 2 and Revelation 13. So here's his characteristics. He's an intellectual genius. We know he's persuasive orator. We know that he's a shrewd politician. We know he's a financial genius, a forceful military leader, and a powerful organizer. And these are all referenced in scripture, and we'll put that mm -hmm. up as well. Many times when the scriptures talk about these things, it's both near <laughs> and far. Mm -hmm. Just like we looked at with the churches. Right. We're talking about a specific church that's doing specific things, and we're also talking about the church, the church age, age and, and <laughs> the end times. And yeah, so right. it, it has lots of layers. So we see the same thing here, too, because Antiochus Epiphanes was in 168 BC. He got beat by the Egyptians, and he was licking his wounds, and so he took it out on the Jews. And he came in, and he took a pig into the temple, and he slaughtered it on the altar, and he put in a statue of Zeus. I mean, he defiled it. That was the abomination of desolation. Right, they called it that in that, the abomination that causes mm -hmm. desolation. So in 166 B.C., there was the Maccabean Revolt. That was the family. They were called the Hammers. <laughs> they got tired of this, and they tried to take back Jerusalem. Now, they weren't taking back all of Israel, but they took back Jerusalem, the city, and the temple. They cleaned it up. And Jesus says, though, that this is a future event. So when Jesus comes on the scene, it's what? It's after this. It's way after yeah. all of this. But yet, and it's yet. coming again. So then that's just a, an example of that the Antichrist is going to come in and do something similar. Mm -hmm. So we saw that he says it in Daniel 7 and then 9 and 11. It'll happen again. And the one who comes and professes to be God himself. And we're going to actually, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but we are going to see in chapter 18. <laughs> yeah. A little more of this. This is kind of picking out those little nuts and bolts, but in 18, we're going to look at how he is going to bring this all to fruition. He is going to be the one who comes in and professes to be God himself. Mm -hmm. It is a man, not a lady. <laughs> Some people have tried to speculate on who the Antichrist will be. It says it's a man. Second Thessalonians 2, 3 says he sits as God in the temple of God. Either he or an idol in the oh, temple. And we've talked about that. Yeah. So the first time Antiochus brought in an idol of Zeus, mm -hmm. it was a statue. Mm -hmm. But as we look at what the beast and the image of the beast is going to be, the beast being the Antichrist, the image of, and it is going to have power to walk and talk, and well, with all the AI stuff going on. Yeah, we feel like that's definitely a possibility mm -hmm. that it will look something like that. So these are the traits of the Antichrist. He will blaspheme God. He will oppose God. He will exalt himself. 
set himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Yeah, he comes as a charismatic political leader. He's charming and secure. He'll secure peace deal between the Jews and the Gentiles. Now, there has not been a temple built since it was destroyed by Rome, but it will be rebuilt. I would even argue, this is me, but when it talks about he will tabernacle with them, mm -hmm. I wonder if there will be a brick and mortar temple or if it will be the rebuilding of the tabernacle. Right. That wouldn't take very long to put up. It, would it wouldn't not. take up that much room. No, it wouldn't. It could have it up in a day or two. Mm -hmm. So if you're feeling like you are safe because the temple hasn't been rebuilt and you're waiting for that brick and mortar <laughs> building, you might be waiting for the wrong thing. Well, you know, because when we were there, we were on the Temple Mount and what is sitting where they think the temple was? What Right now it's a mosque. Mm -hmm. It's a Dome of the Rock. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of <laughs> speculations back and forth depending on who you listen to right. as where it was and how it all go down and all this stuff. But the interesting thing is that it wouldn't have to necessarily be a temple, a temple. on God's holy mountain. No, it would have... It, it, it needs a place to house the Ark of the, of the covenant. covenant and the tabernacle. Mm -hmm. And we see that the Ark of the Covenant shows up in Revelation. the throne room. Yeah. But we don't know for sure that it actually does come back in the temple or the tabernacle. No, well, that's true. Biblically, we don't know that anyway. Right. Right. So when this Antichrist shows up, he's going to dupe most of the Jewish nation into thinking that he's the Messiah. Right. And that's his whole point. He's going to come offering a false peace. <clears throat> and it isn't until he's halfway into this, about the three and a half years, that things change. There's a shift for sure. Mm -hmm. And that's when they will realize that they've put their hope into a false hope right? and that his true colors will show. So the timing of the Antichrist. We said that this is all in that seven years of tribulation. But he's going to come in at the beginning, but he's not going to show his true colors until halfway through. So we know he's really not going to come to power until after the rapture. And why? Because the the Holy Spirit, the church, has been gone, the restrainer. And we know that he will be overthrown by Jesus end. himself. That's in chapter 19. Now, he is probably presently here. Yeah, more than likely, he is working his way in political or leadership somewhere. Just that too many things have fallen into place those pieces of the puzzles have been laid down well, we don't know the day or the hour or maybe even the year but we know that it is getting close enough that for him to be of a political age mm -hmm. to to be able to rule the world mm -hmm. yeah he's not just being born i would even argue we, we talked about the magi mm -hmm. and them coming and seeing the stars and everything to know when christ came on the king came on the scene there was a phenomenon that had happened um, a year or two ago where we had the same kind of constellations and everything coming into order. And I argued that it was the sign of the birth of a new king. I think it's the Antichrist, not him being born, but him Maybe coming on, on the, the scene. scene. There have been several out there that have just started to make their voice heard, their mark. It's been interesting. We've just been kind of watching and paying Waiting. attention. But who knows? We don't know who he is. So the second seal in verse 3 is the fiery red horse. What does the red stand for? It's the color of terror, bloodshed, war. So we know Jesus said there's going to be wars and rumors of wars. And, of course, we've had that for millennial. Right. But I think it might be ramped up. Sure. More wars <laughs> than what we've already had. Mm -hmm. It could definitely be way more bloodshed. And then when the Lamb opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come, and I looked before me, it was a black horse. And his rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand. And then I heard what sounded like a voice among the four living creatures, saying, Two pounds of wheat for a day's wage, six pounds of barley, 
for the day's wage and do not damage the oil or wine. So the third seal, the black horse, the scales, mm -hmm. that's famine and economic collapse. We're talking about our, our financial ruin. Right. So when you, you wonder about that quart of wheat for denarius, you know, what's that? Right. That doesn't well, mean much to us. Okay, take a quart of wheat to make a loaf of bread. And so it would cost roughly right now equal to about $200, $200. Yeah, a day. So think how fragile the economy became with just one virus, right. with COVID. When COVID hit, unemployment went from 3 to 10%. I would argue it was more than that. Right. But if one country falls, it's a domino effect. Right. I mean, just when, when one thing was affected and shipping didn't go, everybody was affected. And Yeah, I mean, the, yeah. all of the dominoes all around the world. You couldn't move product. You couldn't move food. You couldn't bring stuff in. It sat on the docks forever or in storage containers. And It wouldn't, we think that we're safe from something like that happening. But to me, if COVID showed us anything, it, we're very, very, fragile. very fragile. Mm -hmm. Well, in fact, they say there's um, there's 821 million uh, people right now in the world that are food insecure, and 148 million are starving. So when it says don't hurt the oil and the wine, that's actually those are idioms for the wealthy. So he's saying don't don't affect that. There's always going to be the wealthy. You're going to stay wealthy. But if there's already that many people who are food insecure or starving, can you imagine what that'll be like when, when something famine hits? Something hits, yeah. So when the lamb opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come. I looked, and there before me was a pale horse. Its rider was death, and Hades was following close behind him. They were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine and plague, and by the wild beasts of the earth. Well, pale horse, some people have questioned what that color would be, but it's it's a bit of a mistranslation. Mm -hmm. It's actually chloros, which is your chlorophyll, a greenish in color. Mm -hmm. And this horse, death of, it's the death of many unbelievers because the rapture has already happened. happened. And Hades followed with him. The power was given over them. A fourth of the earth, that's about two billion in war and famine and plagues and wild beef. You know, after World War II, more people died of disease, of unsanitary conditions that were rampant from influenza and typhoid than the actual casualties of the war combined. I didn't know that until we started digging into this. That's I know. significant. And in the 14th century, the bubonic plague, which not even with great statistics, had 60% of Europe's population died. That was 75 to 200 million people. And we're talking about 200 billion people being killed. Well, the fifth seal, it talks about the souls of those who are slain. People will die for their faith. They're going to be martyred. Right. And they say, how long before you avenge our deaths? Which I think is interesting. <laughs> They waited until after the rapture. <laughs> exactly, which just kind of shows that the rapture will be pre-trib. Right. Because we won't be here. It's going to be those who have accepted Christ afterwards are the ones that are martyred, and they're going, how long is it going to be before? Well, it makes, it's interesting to think about, because, okay, so that's the fourth seal. Or after the four horsemen. It's the fifth seal. It's the fifth seal, sorry. And so I wonder how much time that will take. Because it's obviously not right at the beginning, unless people, just the rapture happens and they're like, oh, crud, <laughs> we missed it, you know. But then there would have to be time for them to be speaking out and to be martyred. I mean, there's obviously some time that passes. Oh, yeah, there's actually yeah. quite a bit of time. Uh, but they are given robes mm -hmm. and told to be patient. There's still hope for others, others, and that's the whole point. Right. They were able to come to that point to accept Christ then, but there's still going to be many others that have not. And I like the way it says, like, wait for your other brothers and sisters. But then it's sad because it says, who will also die the way you did? <laughs> right. It says they did not worship the beast 
or for receiving the mark of the beast. Okay, so this isn't before all that. This is like, so now we're going through that whole seven years because right. this is after the Antichrist changes and, right. and he requires the mark. Um, so that's the hope. You can still be saved during this tribulation process. Right. And that's what a lot of people don't realize. They think that once that starts, it's over and done with, but it's not. No, because the whole point is to turn up the heat and to just for God to have as many people come to him as possible. Mm -hmm. So the wrath of God is still being poured out. And there's still, there's going to be people that will... So then we're going to get to the sixth seal. And this is in verse 12. Right. And what do we see happening with the sixth seal? Bad things. Very, very bad things. Earthquakes, volcanic explosions, meteor showers, asteroids, tsunamis... Because they, I mean, they talked about literally the stars falling from the skies, islands and mountains no longer be where, being where they were, mm -hmm. and the sky rolling up. Ugh. Like a shrill. Well, let's bring this into a little bit of <clears throat> perspective, perspective that we know. So in 1883, the Karakota Islands in the South Pacific erupted, and 3,000 miles away it could be heard. Oh my goodness. It was recorded in 1883. That's without all the scientific all the stuff that we have, now. we have today. Um, but it created tidal waves that were actually could be felt 1,500 miles away, and it changed the tides 7,000 miles away. Well, and it impacted the weather for two years. So that's just one <laughs> earthquake Way and back. volcanic explosion back. that was a chain reaction. Mm -hmm. So can you imagine all of that being unleashed at the same time? Yeah. Okay, so when it says the moon became like blood, I know we've had a lot of people that are like, oh, there's all these blood moons, and that's it, and this is it. Well, you know what? If you're not going to be here for this blood moon, and when it happens, if you are, you missed it. Right. <laughs> so that's well, like and, a good thing. And this would be part of the sixth seal. I feel like you would notice the first five. Yeah, before. Right now, we actually have several very large asteroids that have been coming near the Earth, uh, 4.2 million miles away, 24,000 miles per hour. Now, according to 2018, a basketball court-sized one came about 2,000 miles away, and NASA missed it until it flew past the Earth. <laughs> I feel like that's a rather <laughs> sizable object. For We're looking minutes. at things that are... Light years, years away, away, right. away. And we had one fire that close. Which then brings us up to the point where, for those of you who know Dr. Tom Horn, mm -hmm. he has written the book, A More Motor Opophis, which is the asteroid that he has, that God had showed him, that's going to actually hit Earth on April 13th, 2029. Yep. So there has been much speculation that that could potentially be the asteroid that it talks about as wormwood in the scriptures that are sandwiched in between that three and a half years. Right, kind of a mid middle of the tribulation. Mm -hmm. Which would have that ripple effect. Mm -hmm. If it hit in the ocean and it caused an earthquake, it would cause a tsunami and it would cause all of these problems. Right, because so. it's... Slightly larger than a basketball court. Yeah. Football field. Yeah, that's bigger. So they all hid in caves and rocks because they wanted to die. Now, I think this is so sad. Yeah. Instead of them kneeling and bowing and humbling themselves before God, they would rather hide and be defiant and act, actually ask for the elements to fall on them and kill them. Right, because they they know that this is the wrath of God, and who can stand it? So, like, you recognize what's happening. It's not like they're even denying God. They're just saying, well, this is too much. Just kill us now. They would rather run from him than to run to him. You know, we always have a choice, and I think that is really the main theme. We're going to see this throughout the entire book of Revelation. Each time, there's always a choice. You have two choices. <laughs> God gives them all the time. You can either run to him, you can either accept him, or you can run from him. You can choose to be defiant. You can choose to harden your heart. You can choose to 
spit in his face. Mm -hmm. And you go, why would people do that? Even with all these seals, even with all the horrible things that are going to happen, and these aren't even the bowl judgments, the trumpet judgments, all no. that stuff coming up. And yet, there will be people that will yeah. just... Yeah. Hard to understand. But ultimately, it doesn't have to be this way. So... If you have been a pew sitter your whole life in church, and when I say that, I mean there are actually people out there who have gone to church every week. They have uh, religiously sat in the pew next to their family or friends, and they've listened to the sermon, but they've never accepted Christ. To me, that's hard to understand. It is. But I know that there are those that have. Or they've said, well, they're doing their religious duty, you know, one of these days I will. Or on, I've heard this one, on my deathbed, I will accept Christ. Let's hope you have one. <laughs> that may not happen. Right. You know, you're not going to get salvation through osmosis. <laughs> it's not about knowledge. You know, family members don't graft you in no. to the body of Christ. It's all about heart. Yeah. Well, the point I think right here of chapter 6 is that this is the beginning <laughs> that will string out. God's willing to string out all of those judgments so that way people have time. He wants nothing more than to bring people to him. You know, we've, we're going to keep looking and diving into the bowl judgments and the, and the trumpet judgments. and It just keeps getting worse. It does. It does, and Revelation isn't an easy, especially this middle section, 6 to 18, not easy books to read. Um, on, on the one side of things, it, you can, if you know that you have accepted Christ, you can go, okay, not going to be here, glad about that. But it's important to read it and know it, if nothing else, that it gives you more incentive to ensure every person you meet has the opportunity to know Christ as well because you wouldn't work you wouldn't wish this on your worst enemy. Mm -hmm. No, and that's why we're really digging into this besides, you know, God just basically said, oh, you're going to do it on Revelation." Yeah. And it's like, "Okay, so here we are." And these are going to be difficult chapters, but the thing is, a lot of this is being shown throughout the Old Testament. There are references, like I said, if you our Jewish brothers and sisters, or you know the Old Testament backwards and forwards, you know what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. And so that is the exciting thing, that this is not just brand new information. Right. Well, some of it is, but it is referenced before. It is. And it just, I guess, helps to paint that full picture. Mm -hmm. And again, is a continuation of God's love and providing opportunity for salvation. Because he could have just come down and wiped us all out at once. You know. Could so have said enough. Rapture. Done. Yeah. And bye everybody else. And, and he gives more chances than any parent normally ever does. His patience knows no end. It's true. But he is still a God of judgment. Right. So, um, yeah. I guess we're just jumping into this. And next week we will be looking at chapter 7. Which will be the seventh seal. Starts the seventh seal and the trumpets. Mm -hmm. So ultimately, the main message out of chapter six is just picking this apart. So once you know, you, you can't, can't unknow. Know, and, and you can't, can't say, we didn't tell you. So until next time. Shalom. Shalom.